It is my honor to introduce our interviewer and our interviewee this morning. Um, conducting our interview today will be Ms. Linda Sh uh, Schacht. For over 30 years, Ms. Schacht has been offering communication and strategic advice to government, business, and nonprofit leaders. She is a veteran of such organizations as the White House Press Office and Coca-Cola, the latter of which she retired from as the Vice President of Global Communications and Public Affairs Strategy. Currently, Ms. Schacht serves as the Executive Director of the Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership here at Lipscomb. And the College of Business is honored to have Diane Creel with us today as our honoree. After beginning her career in marketing, Ms. Creel went on to become the CEO of multiple engineering firms. As chairman, CEO, and president of Earth Tech Inc., Ms. Creel became the first woman to hold the chief executive position of a publicly held engineering firm in the United States. During her tenure as CEO, that company completed dozens of acquisitions and grew its revenues from $50 million to $1.6 billion. After leaving Earth Tech, Ms. Krill became the chairman, CEO, and president of Ecovation Inc., a startup company providing waste to energy treatment solutions to companies in the food and beverage industry. Under her leadership, that company expanded its technology offerings and grew its annual revenue more than 25 times in four years. And in 2008, that company was acquired by Ecolab Inc. for over $200 million. Ms. Krill currently serves on the board of directors of a number of companies, including Allegheny Technologies Inc., where she is the lead director, and also of Timken Steel, where she is a director. She is also the chairman of the Canyon Creek Foundation, which is her philanthropic foundation for the betterment of communities, and has previously served on the boards of such companies as Foster Wheeler and Goodrich Corporation. In addition to serving companies through board membership, Ms. Creel enjoys sharing her experience and knowledge with others through guest lecturing, and also enjoys spending time on her, in her, excuse me, on her ranch in Texas. It is the College of Business's honor to have her with us today, and please join me in welcoming Ms. Shack and Ms. Creel. Well, Diane, we're so happy to have you here with us, and I am honored to be asked by the Dean to interview you. Um, Diane and I are contemporaries, and so I understand how important not just the cracks, but breaking through that glass ceiling uh, that she did for us, when I say us, I mean women, uh, in the last 30 years was truly groundbreaking. But beyond that, she has leadership lessons for all of us, no matter age or gender, and I'm hoping we'll get to those today. Um, so first, let me ask about cracking the ceiling and some of the attributes that you got from your journalism background. I mean, marketing, any marketing majors here today? Okay, good, good. So uh, tell us about how you wound up in journalism and marketing and how that might have played into your move into operations. Well, I am a journalism major, as Linda said, um, and um, I always just thought I wanted to be a writer, right? That's why I go to journalism school. And um, I went to work for, uh, out of school, I, I was uh, needed a job, and I went to work for an architectural engineering firm writing things for them, uh, promotional things, uh, proposals to prospective clients, things like that. And so I stayed in that career my whole life because, um, as I told the students uh, that were with me earlier, um, I did my master's thesis on marketing in architectural engineering services. And I found out there are only about six or seven of us in the country doing that. So I thought, well, this might be a pretty good career path. So I stayed with it. And, um, but I, 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 when I go back to the College of Journalism at the University of South Carolina where I went to school, I always tell journalism students, you know, if you can listen effectively and communicate effectively, you'll be successful. Um, those two things are extremely critical uh, in business, and I think that's part of what what your training in journalism school is is to is to listen and to communicate. And I think um, I'm a I became a marketer because that's where I landed. But it's my nature, I think. To I mean, when we had 200 offices, I was in those 200 offices every year. 
in town hall meetings and face to face, and that's just what I do. And I think um, as a CEO, that's critical. You know, a lot of companies you work there for 20 years and you never meet the CEO. And so, um, and I always think it's important to hear what all your employees think, and sometimes you don't want to hear it, <laughs> okay, <laughs> about you and the business and things like that. So I think the, the communication skill is the common thread, Linda, through all that, and uh, um, has, has done well. Well, and I think those communication skills also were key to some of your early successes. And I'd love you to share the story of how you developed a voice and the confidence to speak up even early in your career. And we'll go to later in your career, but let's, let's look at that first moment of truth when you spoke up and found your voice. You want me to tell that story again? I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as I said this morning at breakfast, I, I have to sort of censor this uh, conversation a little bit. But um, I was 20-some years old, and was I worked for the errant son of the owner who flunked out of architectural school, and he flunked out of Harvard Business School, and so he was put in charge of marketing, right? That's where you put us all. <laughs> And um, so I said that um, he was sort of a mentor in a very strange way because I did his job for him all the time. And he was one of these people who didn't like to look at anything until the last minute, right? And used to frustrate me. So I, he'd spend days and days and days preparing something and he'd decide the night before it was due that he'd take a look at it. So I, I had prepared this proposal and it was with, uh, some of you may know the name I am Pay, the architect I am Pay. It was for a proposal for a building with I am Pay. And so it was like a book. It wasn't like a notebook, okay, that you could take pages out of. It was a bound book. So he decided, he started red penciling it all, you know. And I said, unfortunately for me, the peak of my anger is tears, okay? This is past screaming, hollering, stomping, rolling around on the floor. <laughs> it's tears. And um, so I felt these tears welling up in my eyes, and I was so upset because I didn't want him to see them. And he looks up at me, and he says, darn it, Diane. He said, that's why I don't like to hire women for responsible positions. You tell them to do something, they don't want to do it, they cry. And I go, well, the only difference between me and some man is that I'm going to fix your proposal, and some man would tell you to stick it in your ear. Okay? <laughs> and so I think that's what Linda's talking about is it, you know, in business, even when you're young, you have to sort of establish your, your boundaries of what's reasonable and what's not reasonable for you to accomplish and uh, strive to accomplish those things. And he never looked at another proposal after that. I think I just, you know, sort of floored him. But, um, but you know, sometimes you just have to stand up. And it's your voice, as you say. And you've been doing it all your life. And sometimes in venues and in industries that were not used to having women in charge, yes. or even women in their ranks. Right. So can you talk about working with engineers and scientists and what helped catapult you up through the ranks to become the chairman and CEO of companies in those industries? Well, one thing I learned very early on, there's a couple of things, but one thing I learned very early on is I didn't try to tell them what they do. Because in about five minutes, they would prove me really stupid, okay? Because I didn't really know everything technically that they did. But what I did know is if they could tell me what they did, then I could A, sell that when I was in marketing, and B, strategically make it work for the growth of the business. But I didn't, I didn't ever pretend. You know, I always just backed down because they all wanted to tell me how much they knew, and I knew they knew a lot. And it goes to one of my leadership uh, tenants that we talked about this morning, and that is being able to hire and trust people that are smarter than you are. And I had to depend upon them because I, you know, over time, I almost became an engineer in, in the sense that they couldn't tell, but uh, that made me worried too, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't build any bridges. Right, right. <laughs> but, um, but I think depending upon people that are smarter and their advice and trusting them and also not trying to tell them what they do, but to use your talents to make them more successful. And that, that's really what it was all about. There was one example. How many finance majors here? 
Good, good. Okay, there was one example you gave about dealing with your CFO after you became CEO of a company. And I was struck by the way that you not only handled him, who woke up one morning and you were his boss. You mean firing him? Yeah, no. well, no, no, not yet. Not the firing part. But, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but your belief in communication really came through in how you responded to him giving you all those printouts. Right. And asking him to produce something that was easily understandable. Can you talk about that? Yeah, what Linda's talking about is um, I was making the point uh, earlier today that it's very helpful to know all aspects of the business. So if you're a finance person, it's helpful to know marketing. If you're a marketing person, it's helpful to know finance, operations, uh, technology development, all those things. And I didn't do that the way I should have done it uh, as I was in marketing for many years. So um, the CFO hated marketing you, for you finance people. He thought it was just this bottomless pit you put money in and there's really no significant benefit to it. So um, I, he woke up one day and I was his boss, right? So now all of a sudden I wasn't marketing, I was the CEO. And he came in one day and he dumped this big thing of computer printouts. This is aging me. This is when your computer <laughs> took a whole room, right? And, he, and the printouts, and he threw them on my conference table and he said, well, here's, here's the monthly financials. And i like, okay, what am I going to do here? I don't know how to read those monthly financials, really. Um, and I said, so I called him back in. I said, okay, I want you to draw me eight graphs every month. I'm a right brain person, okay? I think more creatively than numbers. So draw me this graph about revenue, profitability, staff utilization, collections, ARs, aging receivables, all those kinds of things that are going to help me run this business. Of course, you know, and um, so he was very indignant about having to do that. So subsequently, our relationship didn't work out very well. And, um, but the point is, you know, you find a way around getting done what you need to get done. And... Um, and I think that's sort of the moral to that story. But, uh, and also, to learn as much as you can about the whole business. You know, I love these companies, and, and I, I, we didn't do this, we should have, that will rotate employees through various departments so they can learn about the whole business. To me, that is just extremely critical in being a major player. And the thing I said this morning earlier is it, it, it helps you understand the business, but it helps you find your passion. Because your passion may not be in your box that you're in right now. It may be in some other box. And uh, so I think, I think that's a great corporate uh, uh, program when companies do that. I was struck this morning by all your leadership lessons, but several of them have to do with creating, articulating, and executing a vision. Can, can you talk about how you think through that, work with people to make sure they understand your vision and their part in it? Yeah, I think a CEO's worst fear is to yell charge and look behind him, nobody's there, right? So, um, I think one thing that's important in developing a vision is to not have it be your vision, but have it be the employees, the company's vision for what they should do. And so getting people involved in the development of that vision. Now, they may end up at exactly the same point I ended up with at, thinking that's what we should do. But the involvement gets the buy-in, and the buy-in gets the execution success. And um, so I've always, uh, and I didn't leave the vision development to top level management necessarily. We went down, down through the ranks to get everybody's, or not everybody's, but as many sort of what I would consider creative thinkers input to what that vision is. And then you have to just drive it home every day. I mean, you know, in our company you would go through the offices and you see posters about about uh, our strategy and what we were trying to get accomplished and, and um, people lived it and breathed it and 
we tracked it to make sure we, we were living the vision and that our strategy for growth was successful or not. And sometimes we developed strategies that were really terrible and we said, oh my gosh, we got to get out, forget this one, this one isn't working. And, um, but the point is that everybody knows the direction that you're going in. And particularly when you're in a business with high acquisition rights where you're integrating different cultures every week, it's really important that people know why. Why are we doing this? Are those people coming in to take my job? Or no, they're coming in because they're part of the vision. They either offer something that we don't have geographically, technically, um, and that we need to implement the vision. So um, I think buy-in in, in that is critical. And it's not the CEO's vision. It's the employee's vision. Great, great. I want to ask several questions about risk-taking. Sure. Uh, the first is you acquired many companies when yes. you were in, in your career, and that had to have involved a lot of negotiation. Do you have any negotiation tips here for the <laughs> students in terms of how to bring about those acquisitions? I do, and I'll tell you, it's one big issue. And that is, I used to walk in, you know, particularly when companies were looking at several other companies that, and trying to decide who they, who should, they should sell to, and these CEOs would walk in and say, well, nothing's going to change. And I go, nothing's going to change. Why do it if nothing's going to change? If your company's going to stay the same and the company you're buying is going to stay the same, why do it? You know, so honesty to me was absolutely critical in those negotiations. Do not say anything that you're not going to live up to post-deal. And a lot of those CEOs that I lost the, the deal would come back to me later and they say, you know, I wish we would have listened to you because things have changed and everybody told us they weren't going to change. You buy a company and you integrate them into your company and you want it to be all one company. You don't want it to be all fragmented. And so things are going to change. So some, but the reason you buy a company is it has really some very good qualities and you need them. So you take the best of either world. You don't take it my way, do it my way, but you try to take the best of both worlds, but things are going to change. Risk-taking question number two. You decided, after running a huge cor uh, corporation, to take a risk on a startup. Can you yes. talk about jumping out of your comfort zone to do that? Oh, yeah. That was... Uh, I um, had never run a startup, and so I went... As I said earlier, I think I went from 9,000 employees to having 11. And um, from flying around in a corporate jet to sitting in coach and having a driver and r driving my own SUV through the snow in Rochester, New York. So, but um, <laughs> it, um, it is a huge risk, a startup. Uh, when I became CEO of Earth Tech, back up a minute, it was $50 million in revenue. Okay, you got a company. It's running, it's doing pretty good. You got, you got what I would call a fence around you a little bit to lean on, you know? When you go to a startup company, you don't have anything to lean on except sheer determination and drive to make this company successful. And that's a risk, you know? And there were days when I didn't know if we were gonna make it or not. There were months I couldn't take a salary, um, you know? and. Um, you know, you, you just drive forward and keep going and hope that you, you hit the day when this all is worthwhile. And I was lucky and that happened. But if you look at startups in this country, not a, you know, you get about one for every eight or nine that are successful. I mean, every eight or nine that fail, you get one or two successful businesses. So it's tough business and you have to, you have to change your mentality to say, you know, if I might fail here, and, you know, and if I do, I, it won't be because I didn't do the best I could. Yeah, right. so. Risk taking number three. So you decide <laughs> you're going to retire, you buy a ranch with horses, mm -hmm. even though you've never ridden, mm -hmm. never owned a ranch, mm -hmm. and decided that's what you were gonna do, and, mm -hmm. then, you, and then you started a foundation. Can yeah. you talk about both those? Sure. <laughs> Uh, you know, my life, when you say it the way you say it, Linda, it sounds kind of crazy. Oh. <laughs> now, wait a minute. You said crazy was good here somewhere. Yeah. You said the grace change. Yeah, it's kind of like, okay, did I do that really? Okay. Um, I, um, you know, sort of, I've called growing up in corporate America, 
I had to live, move around a lot. I had to live in cities, and I always felt I wanted space, and I love animals. I, I jokingly say sometimes I love animals more than most people. Uh, please don't take that personally, <laughs> any of you, but... Um, um, and I wanted to retire in an environment where I had space and I could have animals and peaceful and I could go home and be peaceful and, and then I can step out if I want to and do other things. But um, so I decided I would buy a ranch in Texas. <laughs> and, um, and then I decided that if you're gonna have a ranch, you have to have animals on it, right? So bought some horses, friend of mine said horses are like potato chips you can't have just one they're right so <laughs> then I got some mules and I got some donkeys and I got some Texas Longhorn cattle and first thing you know you know I've got a ranch and um, I learn it every day I have people that work for me that are very knowledgeable fortunately otherwise my poor animals would I don't know they'd suffer I'm sure from my uh, my care and feeding but um so you said that was part of always learning. That always you learning. To keep your mind. Right. <laughs> the one thing, you know, I'll tell you something. This is, uh, we were talking a bit about this at dinner the other night, but the thing that scares you to death is when you retire and you live by your calendar for 38 years and you wake up and there's nothing on your calendar, right? And you go, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do today. And um, so you have to find ways that maybe aren't the same ways you historically have challenged yourself, but you have to find new ways to challenge yourself, to always learn and to feel like, you know, that you're using your talents, hopefully, um, in different ways. Um, and I think that's the ranch, and I think that's the foundation. The foundation. And I established this foundation. Um, it's uh, f to support communities and different things and uh, we do, we try to help and as best we can we try to give back and that's part of retirement too I think. That's part of when you've done your thing and you've had a good life and giving back is critical. There's two parts of that I'd love you to share. One is the, the way you've engaged your nieces and nephews. Right. And the other, some examples of what you're doing around the world. Yeah, I, I, one of the reasons that I started this foundation and I put my nieces and nephews on the board, I don't have children, but I have nieces and nephews, is I wanted them to learn about philanthropy. And I wanted them to learn how important it was uh, to give back. And so a lot of the things that we do are things that they want to do or that they recommend that we do. And um, so some of the things that we do, uh, we support uh, Church of Christ missions in Honduras uh, by building daycare centers because as those of you who've been into Central America on missions know that children that become 10 or 11 years old uh, end up taking care of the babies and they don't further their education beyond 10 or 11 years of age. So if you have daycare centers, you can put the little ones in the daycare centers and the other children can, can finish their education, finish school. So we do that. We do um, a, a program called Camp Casey, which is um, uh, horsey house calls where children with cancer that it's terminal who want to ride a horse and never ridden a horse, you bring the horse to their house, you knock on the door, and I mean the parents know you're coming, huh? you knock on the door with your horse and you take them for a ride around the neighborhood and you have a little party for them and uh, things like that. Those are the kinds of things that we do. Um, and we have a variety of things. We're not a big foundation, but um, you know, it's fun to, to help. Well, one of your leadership lessons earlier was to inspire, and you certainly have inspired us. And I'm going to open it up to questions uh, from all of our students here. And I'll, if you don't ask a question, I'll call on you. So some, make sure your neighbor is asking a question. Yes. Sure, and it, it's the toughest part of the job, I will tell you. It's the most agonizing part of the job. It's not something that, if it comes easy for you, there's something wrong with you, okay? Because it's, it's, uh, it's not easy. But there are just bad matches in life, you know? And this employee may be a really good person, really nice person, but not the right person in this particular slot. 
<laughs> and, um, and, and maybe they don't want to be in the slot to start with. You know, they're, they're sort of lackadaisical about that and maybe not wanting to be there and not giving you the best that they have to give. And you have to make those decisions and it, it is very difficult, very difficult. Um, but if you're going to run a successful company, you can't, you can't live with mediocrity. Okay, you just can't live with mediocrity. And, um, and I understand that people have other priorities and other things that they want to do, and I try to respect that. But when you're in, in, in the business and you're working in the business, give me something besides mediocrity. If you want to go coach your son's little league ball game at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's okay. But don't give me mediocrity when you're in the house, so to speak. Okay, and so that's, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, um, I've never sold a piece of my business, okay? I bought a lot. I'm a buyer, not a seller. Um, and so I've never, I, I, I would think that would be incredibly difficult. I have been sold, okay? I, but I made the decision to sell my company. But I've never just broken off divisions. But a lot of companies have to do that. Because 20 years ago, the markets were different than they are today. And um, so you have to sometimes sell off pieces of the business. And the home that they find hopefully is better than yours because they have like uh, products or, or like markets or like services that, that make that other company stronger. Another question? Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I went to the hospital a couple times. <laughs> um, I, lo I, I, um, I love my horses. Um, I collect classic cars, too. Uh, oh, tell us about one of the classic cars. <laughs> so um, that's a relatively new passion of mine. I've always loved cars, you know, but collecting classic cars is a pretty new passion. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I try to look for things that are fun and challenging and, um, you know, I, I, um, I just love new things. You know, I love to learn new things. And so I just keep trying, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I go, well, I'm not going to, I don't like that, you know. <laughs> but I love my horses and I love my ranch. That, that will never change, you know. I might get rid of the cars someday. Never getting rid of the horses. <laughs> I think I saw one back here. Young lady. Okay, I'm going to call on the young lady back there. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, this morning at breakfast, you were giving statistics of women. I mean, you were graduating college, the 11%, and now today being around 30%. Right. Um, what would your advice be to the women in this room trying to follow in the footsteps that you? I, I would hope that, and I see evidence of this, that it's easier now than it was. I used to say, this is not gray hair, this is a helmet. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like bumping against it, every, that ceiling every morning. But um, I think it's easier. And I would say the one thing, the very one thing is hard work. I mean, there's no substitute for hard work. People recognize hard work, and they will give you opportunities to do more and more and more and more when you contribute. And the other thing is, and, and it sort of goes back to the comment before, not so much telling your boss where to put the proposal, but <laughs> it, of speaking up for yourself and your capability and your talent. Because... Sometimes people aren't going to speak up for you. Okay. And you know, I, I'll tell you something. This is a secret. It's probably not a good example. Not, I'm probably not being a good example for all of you. But I never said I couldn't do something. <laughs> if somebody, if some, my boss gave me something to do, I'd take it, and then I'd figure out how to do it or get help from people who knew how to do it. I never said, I don't know how to do that or I can't do that. Um, so, and that's true men or women. Okay, either way. But I think women sometimes have to push a little harder. They have to push a little harder. If I may add, the research shows that women don't ask. They don't ask for the promotion or the good assignment. 
and they look at a res they look at a job description and ten things are needed and they say, well, I've got seven, I'm not going to apply. The research shows a man looks at it and says, oh, I've got three, I'm going to apply. <laughs> so just keep in mind, for all of you, it's important to make sure yeah. people know of your good work and ask for the good promotion. Ah. Yes, yes, sir. So starting off as a journalist and then, you know, rising the ranks to become chairman, CEO, lead director, several different organizations, what was your largest motivating factor to break the glass in to do all these great things? Um... I didn't want to be bored. <laughs> I didn't want to keep doing the same things I did every day. I wanted to learn new things and consequently I wanted to keep pushing to get exposure to those new things. And um, so I would say it was not wanting to be bored and also wanting to do a good job. You know, the only thing I ever really wanted was for people to say, Diane did a good job. Okay, Diane. Diane makes a contribution, um, and that was a real motivating factor to me. Um, I came from a military family, and I think we're all product of, of our environments. And my father was one tough son of a gun, I'm going to tell you. You know, uh, I, I remember, and um, uh, you'll appreciate this story, David, I, I was going to take my instrument rating test, and um, as a pilot, and my instructor had suggested that I take the test and then go study and take the test because it's a very difficult test. And so I took the test, and I think I got a 68 or something for 70s passing. And so my father said, well, how'd you do on the instrument test? And I said, oh, I got a 68. I said, but I learned how, I know how to take this test now, and I'm going to go back and take it again. And he said, and I said, everybody told me that I would probably fail it the first time, but then go back and take. And he said to me, is everybody else's stupidity an excuse for yours? <laughs> okay, so that's, <laughs> that's kind of how I grew up, okay? So um, on the other side of that coin, I was never told I couldn't do something. Okay, so um, I think your upbringing, you know, and your desire to 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 learn and your desire to do a good job and your desire for your fellow workers to think you're doing a good job is a real motivator to climbing. It wasn't, I never said I want to be a CEO, okay, just so you know that. That was never in my thought process when I entered the workforce, ever. Never thought it, you know how people, sometimes they have this plan, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to be a CEO. That was not me. My, me was to do the best I could do wherever I was in hopes that I'd get an opportunity to do something new or different. Great. Uh, I think, okay, we have a hands up, so I'll take one more back there. This is the last one. Uh, you talk, I love your advice about surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you, and that's a really <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think that <clears throat> when you, you have to build a team around you, okay? You have to build a team. You can't be this individual and this individual and this individual, but you have to build a team, and the team helps you qualify, let's say, whether those are good contributors or not, or whether they know what they're doing or not. So you don't have to make that decision singularly. I never had to make that decision singularly. There have been, you know, I've made some huge mistakes sometimes in hiring people. Um, it takes a while for you to know whether you can trust them or whether they really know what they're talking about or not. Some people are great interviewers, okay? Great interviewers, but when you get them in the company, it's like, what happened between the interview and now? So um, it takes a while, but you have to give them, their, give them their space and try it and see if it works, and hopefully it does. But it's usually the team that helps you decide if they are, in fact, qualified. I think we'll end on her last leadership lesson from this morning, Diane, and that is always bring out the best in people. I think you've brought out the best in us today. Thank you for inspiring us, and let's give Diane a Thank you. Hand.